Uh, I was born in 1953. I actually moved a lot, so I was in several different schools, but ended up at Caroli Elementary in West Monroe, and uh, went to West Monroe Junior High, and then West Monroe High School. Then I went to Northeast, not too far away, just across the river. Uh, I was, I was pursuing there uh, a major in theater speech. And uh, after about uh, a year and a half, I transferred to Centenary and, and finished in theater speech. Of course, my mother, recognizing that I may never have a job in that area, uh, made me get a teaching certificate. So I was with the first group that got teaching certificates. Well, of course, at that time, you don't think about the influence that they have on you. You just think you're finding your own path, but sometimes it's eerily similar. But, well, my father was running for alderman. I was running for something like class representative. And one of the teachers who was supporting him came to me and said, you know, I think, I think you'll do well, but do not use any negative advertising. Like, you know, the posters, you put posters up all over school. Be positive. And uh, oddly enough, I mean, that's a thought I've carried throughout the campaigns I did have. I graduated from Centenary in 1975, immediately went to Dallas to do what I call talent work, which means if somebody go hire you for a, a, a commercial or an ad or do uh, take a photo of you in the latest fashions, whatever they will hire you for, that's what I was doing. I later went to Chicago and did the same thing and then at some point went to work for the Merchandise Mart there, and then just came back to Shreveport and went to KTBS. Well, they, they kind of folded into each other. From the talent work, I went into uh, TV, which I took to be sort of brainiac and talent, although I actually did the assignments editing and six o'clock news producing. I was occasionally on air, but mainly I was doing the movie reviews. So that's, that, that was the path. At some point in TV news, you try to move up and you try to move up uh, to bigger markets. So I was looking at having to start moving around the country if I wanted to advance and decided at that time, well, and really on a whim, to take the LSAT. I went to LSU Law School in 1979 one of my most notable professors was Professor George Pugh, who, who of course was in the criminal field. I was uh, a, a law clerk at the DA's office, so I had a, quite an acquaintance with the criminal law and therefore I, I think he really uh, paid more attention to me because of that. But I just remember at one party, he came up to me and, and just says some kindness, like, I think you're going to do well and what are you planning to do, but I think you'll be very successful. That's it. Just a little statement like that, but it really stayed with me. And when people give you that kind of affirmation, I think it makes you have the confidence to, you know, try to do well. The first year in law school, even though you weren't supposed to work, I did shoot commercials. I also had gone to the DA's office to see if I could get a job, although then I later learned I wasn't supposed to be a law clerk during that year because they wanted you to concentrate on uh, school. But O.C. Brown wanted to do a cable TV show. Cable news was pretty new at that time. And so he asked me to host it. So I was a hostess. Having said that, I would introduce him and he talked the entire time without taking a breath. So I never asked another question for 30 minutes. I went immediately to the DA's office. Um, I had, during law school, one summer I had worked at the U.S. Attorney's office, but the U.S. Attorney had left by then, and so I went to the DA's office and uh, was promptly hired by, hired by Paul Carmish. When I went to see Paul, I had two big questions for him. One was, I have all this experience already as a law clerk at the DA's office, and couldn't I start as a felony assistant instead of a misdemeanor like everyone else? Well, the answer was no, <laughs> and he was right. I needed to start as a misdemeanor attorney and work my way through that. Uh, the other question was, are you nervous that you may be the target of, you know, of, of crime or that some, you know, some defendant might get mad at you and you're, you get shot? And, and he thought about it and thought about it and he went, you know, I really haven't been concerned since I've, been, since I've finished doing uh, 
uh, domestic cases. In the DA's office, you try a multiple, multitude of types of uh, cases. Um, I started out, of course, as the misdemeanor attorney and then was a felony attorney. And uh, sometimes I didn't have the most uh, egregious cases, but maybe in my section chief would. And at some points that was Scott Creighton, he would, have, he would have some of the more exciting cases because he had been at the DA's office longer than I. And I would beg Scott to let me help him try cases. And, and he would, so I got to try a lot of the, the, the murder cases and rape cases with Scott Creighton. Well, I married Gary Gaskins in 1985, one of the more fortunate events of my life. He has been such a, a great husband, and without a husband like him, I don't think I could have ever run for judge. He was right there every step of the way in encouraging me and helping me. Uh, we have three children, William, Walt, and Maggie. When I was in law school, I thought I'd want to run f for DA. Then I worked for the DA's office. And there's much to admire about doing the job, but a lot of it is administrative. And I was in the courtroom every day as a prosecutor. So I so soon turned my sights to being a judge. And so uh, when there was an opening at Shreveport City Court, uh, I decided to run for it. I had a, a year before actually the election was going to be called, so I was able to get around and, and get to know people during that year. Uh, back when I ran in 1990, there had been no woman in this area that had run for judge. So it was a little bit different. In fact, when Gary and I would go campaigning, uh, and I would say, I'm running for judge, they would hear the word judge, and then they would look at Gary and go, now what judgeship is it? <laughs> but people were very kind. The other thing they might say to me is like, well, you know, you're, you're too pretty to put somebody in jail, <laughs> or too nice to put somebody in jail. So uh, I had to advise them that I actually had put plenty of people in jail at the DA's office. But uh, people, uh, I, for the most part, were very, very kind and supportive, and the timing was good. I mean, that's when we've started seeing other women running for elective office. I was a, when I uh, was elected to Shreveport City Court, I, was, I believe I was 38 years old. Uh, Lee Irwin would have been maybe a, a year or two younger than I and Bill Kelly was probably about 10 years older. But we were all f freshly uh, elected, more or less, and we all came from the district court. So we, we had the advantage of having been a part of an, an, a court that had been uh, updated, uh, was progressive, and we were able to take those things that we were used to to city court and make improvements there. Part of the reason I left city court was um, I really couldn't see myself doing tra traffic tickets f for many, many years. Although I have to say that the schedule now is much more agreeable than it was back then. But what actually happened was um, I chose the seat I wanted to run for. I was elected. And then I found out that uh, it had not been pre-cleared by the Justice Department. So my seat was up for, for grabs, and uh, there was a real move to have minority districts at that time, which there was a consent decree at some point, and th that happened on ev every level, or on the district court, specifically appellate court and then city court. Uh, so I knew that I was going to have to move, and so uh, there was an open seat at the Court of Appeal. Now, I would like to tell you that I had this driving force to be a Court of Appeal lawyer. I, I didn't know if I would love it or not. I, quite frankly, I hoped I would. I thought I would. Uh, I had some experience behind me, but um, I didn't know. And, I, and my plan, which would have been unusual for a judge, but my plan was if I did not like it, then turn around and run for district court, which would be unusual because it would be what people think is going back lower. The, uh, at, the, at the swearing-in, yes, I had all three children there. The, the, the funny thing that happened was my daughter was being held by her grandmother in the front row, and as I was about to be sworn in, and Gary was standing there holding the Bible for my swearing-in, my daughter ran up to me and was grabbing at me, so I, I, I was sworn in holding my daughter and raising my right hand. <laughs> I thought I had somewhat decent skills for mediation while I was at the Court of Appeal. Uh, and so I went off, uh, 
retired. I went to the Strauss Pepperdine School of Mediation. They had a seminar up in Vermont, and I went directly there several days after I retired. And uh, began a mediation practice in civil cases and later in domestic cases. There were quite a few attorneys doing the civil mediation. <coughs> I therefore started uh, really concentrating on the domestic and ended up doing quite a few domestic mediations. During those mediations, I, I, I found, I thought I had the correct disposition for that sort of work. And uh, of course, it can be very excitable uh, <laughs> with two people sitting in the room. And most of the times I would do it without the attorneys present. But uh, quite often, and even very much to my surprise, we would have a resolution at the end of the mediation and only two hours later. All right now I'm doing ad hoc and pro tempore work. I decided to close the mediation business about a year ago. And so, uh, but I did, I, I, I had stopped doing, I did not take appointments initially. Um, and somebody had suggested that I not while I tried to be a mediator because that sometimes would, um, probably just dissuade the attorneys from asking for you to mediate their case. So I, I didn't do it initially, and I found I missed that. And so now I've been uh, substitute judging, as I call it, on all levels. So I go to city court some. I got to go to the Supreme Court for one case. Uh, I'm about to go to Bossier Parish Court for a few months. So it's, it's uh, enjoyable and invigorating, because I do actually have to go back and study. I have heard that I will be the first woman judge to sit for uh, any appointment uh, or at, at all at the Bossier City Court. The funny thing is that I, they asked me to do occasionally a children's sermon, which is done in what we call big church. And uh, because of my theater background, I'm kind of somewhat uh, expressive maybe <laughs> or acting out some of the things. But, uh, and people come up to me and compliment me, which is so nice, and of course in church they're likely to do that. But uh, one day, not too long ago, I went to my mother and said, you know that theater degree that you did not want me to get? <laughs> well, I'm using it for God's work now, <laughs> so. When I look back at my life, at my, at my family, at uh, my forebearers, um, I, I see that it all folds into your life. And that includes the things you've done, doing the talent work. It all folds back into your life, whether it, uh, you know, the, the, the TV uh, producing actually helped me when I ran for judge because I was able to write my own commercials and have them produced as I wished. So everything you do in life actually comes, comes back on you in a good way. That is also true about relationships. And how often do we find that someone that maybe we didn't get along with or didn't have a strong relationship, at some point they come back in our lives in a different way. And uh, I think some people regret that they maybe didn't give them due deference when they should have at an earlier time. But uh, life is an interesting journey. In retirement, and one of the reasons I quit mediation was because I wasn't doing those things that you expect to do when you retire, the things that you have waited until retirement to do, and one of those is art, and another is pottery, and the third one is Bible study. And my, my father actually was a businessman, but he had an art studio in the backyard, he built an art studio, and then he was a really good artist. My mother wouldn't even like to sign her name. She had me sign her name, I mean, and, and your signature is the first part of art. So we were shocked when he got her to go to classes, and she did a great job. She's a good artist. So I, we have this talent that kind of does trickle through the family, so I'm working on that part of my talent. The other thing I've done, and if I win the lottery, I would like to do, and that is uh, be an architect. I have uh, drawn up my two houses, one of the last of which I actually then got a real architect then to, to, to finalize it and do, you know, make some great changes of which he did. But I enjoy doing that. I actually like the study of space and uh, how it looks. So I, I might go and do spec houses if I, if I ever get that big check. 
I think of what my mother used to tell us every time we would leave the house, and she would look at us and say, be good as gold. Well, I know that really meant don't embarrass yourself and don't embarrass the family. So I hope I've been good as gold.